Um, okay, so good morning everyone um, and welcome to the Kites HR Breakfast Club. Um, my name is Lucy Scott, I'm the Marketing Assistant here at Kites and I will be your host for this morning. <laughs> Um, just a brief bit of background, um, if you haven't been to one of these webinars before, just about um, who we are. Uh, so Kites is an award-winning uh, commercial law firm based out of Manchester City Centre, and one of our key specialisms is providing expert guidance to employers and HR professionals. Um, for those of you who have been to one of our webinars before, um, welcome back. It's really nice to see you all here again. Um, we hope that everyone finds today's uh, session useful and informative. So I will just take you through everything now. Um, so your speakers for today, um, we've got all kite speakers today. So we have um, our employment solicitor, uh, James Howarth. Um, Head of Employment, Kevin McKenna, um, our corporate partner, Kirsty Pinnell, and then our head of IP, Bruce Jones. So um, this is just the agenda for today. So um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about some housekeeping and like ways to connect with us and all that good stuff. Um, then James is going to be taking you through um, the case law update. Um, he's then going to pass over to Kevin, who is doing our HR hotspot today, which is um, the battle for recruitment. Um, then Kevin is going to pass over to Kirsty. Um, she's going to be talking about employee, employment incentivization strategies and schemes um, that you might like to implement. And then um, Bruce is just going to talk briefly um, about reputational management. So um, here are all the ways to connect with us. Um, you can give us a ring, you can email us, um, visit our website. Um, on our website, we have um, uh, a load of insights, insight pieces um, from all of our lawyers, from all of our different um, departments. Um, and also on our website, you can join our mailing list. Um, so the mailing list is a really great way of seeing all the content that we put out. It just gets... Um, delivered straight to your mailbox um, and it's also the way that you get your invites to the HR Breakfast Club so you can sign up um, to our mailing list there and um, then we've just got all of our social media handles at the bottom there so we are at Kite Solicitors on everything um, Twitter, LinkedIn um, and then if you want to see um, our previous HR Breakfast Clubs that we've done um, we have um, what are they called? We have a playlist, that's what they're called, um, on our YouTube channel of all of our previous HR, HR Breakfast Clubs. So yeah, you just have to search in Kites on your YouTube bar and then you will see all of those. Um, so housekeeping, um, in terms of questions, uh, the agenda today, I think we're going to run pretty much 2.11. Um, so there's not going to be time at the end for questions. But if you do have questions, as always, please feel free to put them in to the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, and we will follow up with you afterwards. Um, we will be sending a follow-up email uh, after today's webinar as well. So in that follow-up email, you will get uh, contact details for all of the speakers. Um, there'll also be a link to our survey um, just to see like what you thought of um, this morning's presentations. So we'd be really appreciative if you could fill that out. It'll only take you two seconds. Um, and there will also be a link to um, this morning's um, webinar, which you can share with colleagues who maybe couldn't make it today. Um, so, yeah, I think, yeah, so that's it from me. Um, I'm just going to pass over to James now, who's going to take you through the case law. Thanks, Lucy, and uh, good morning, everybody. So the first case I'm going to talk to you about today is the case of Rogers versus Leeds Laser Cutting Limited. And this is particularly interesting because it's the first COVID case that's made it to the Employment Appeals Tribunal, so, so the EAT. So the claimant worked for the respondent as a laser operator and had around one year's service by the time of his dismissal. So if you remember, all the way back in March 2020, that's when we had the first national lockdown due to COVID, and that's when we were all told to work from home if we possibly could. Well, the claimant here couldn't do that, given the role that he did and the machinery that he used. And that was actually quite common for lots of employees at the respondent. So what they decided to do is, is take all measures they possibly could to mitigate some of the risks of COVID. And they implemented a risk assessment. 
So some of the things that they did were the increased cleaning around the premises. They had uh, staggered start and end times, finish times, and also they implemented strict social distancing measures as well. Although to be fair, that wasn't a huge concern for the claimant given that he worked in a, a large warehouse with, with just five people. So his interactions were fairly limited anyway. <clears throat> Despite this, um, a few days after the risk assessment was implemented, the claimant decided to leave work and he emailed his manager to say that he would be, and I quote, staying off work until lockdown had eased. This was because he had a newborn child and another child who was clinically extremely vulnerable. So the claimant didn't take any steps then to contact the respondent. And after a period of a month, the respondent decided to dismiss him because he was absent without leave. So as I mentioned before, the claimant didn't have sufficient service to bring an ordinary unfair dismissal claim. So what he did instead was he brought an automatic unfair dismissal claim under Section 100 of the Employment Rights Act. So this section states that any dismissal is automatically unfair in circumstances of danger, which an employee reasonably believes to be serious and imminent. And that's the kind of the key phrase there. And also the employee couldn't reasonably expect it to avert that risk and refuse to return to his place of work. So that is a day one right for employees. And obviously you don't need to have two years service to bring that type of unfair dismissal claim. And obviously that's what he did because he didn't have that service. So both the tribunal and the EAT rejected his claim. So what they said was, although his concerns around COVID were absolutely genuine, they weren't specific or sufficiently well-founded enough to fall within the protection of, of statutory protection. So the reason for this was essentially threefold. So firstly, in his email to his manager, he made no reference whatsoever to workplace danger. He merely cited lockdown generally. So for that claim to work, he needs to have a, there needs to be a serious and imminent danger, or at least the claimant has a reasonable belief in that. And clearly he didn't set that out in his complaints when he left. Secondly, the tribunal was minded that the respondent had taken all reasonable steps it could to mitigate the risks of, of COVID. So the EAT said that there was no way that the claimant could have reasonably believed that his place of work was any more dangerous than the world at large. Again, so that serious and imminent bit failed. And finally, uh, the claimant really didn't help himself. So firstly, he broke lockdown rules by taking his friend to hospital shortly after leaving the employment. And secondly, and I've got very little sympathy for this, he also worked in a local pub throughout lockdown, clearly in a workplace that was a lot less secure than the one he said was, was causing him a risk. So the positive from this is that employee, employers sorry, who undertook risk assessments, took uh, appropriate measures to mitigate risks of COVID should see this as a massive positive. Um, the EAT didn't say that a Section 100 claim for COVID will always fail, so it will depend on the circumstances. But I think, yeah, this is just a massive positive for employers who did the right thing, if not quite a complete defense. So the second case I'm gonna talk to you about today is the case of Leia versus Aspers. Um, and this is only a tribunal decision, so it's not binding on other cases, but actually the judging panel came to quite some interesting conclusions, which, which we'll talk about. So the claimant here brought a multitude of claims. So she brought claims of constructive unfair dismissal, harassment, victimization, breach of holiday pay, race discrimination, age discrimination, that there was quite a lot. And she brought that specifically against Aspers as the first respondent, but actually also included members of her management team as well. So her HR manager, her direct line supervisor, they were named as respondents. So it's always a reminder that individual employees can be brought into these types of things. And when they do, it does often add, um, it did often add additional complexities to defending these kind of things. So the claimant is a mixed black African heritage and was 41 years old when she started working at Aspers in 2011. She worked as a cashier in, in Aspers London Super Casino. And she had 22 years of experience working on gaming tables, cashier desks. Um, and she also managed a, a betting uh, shop as well for a period of time. 
But despite that vast experience, she was continually overlooked for roles. And often these individuals who promoted were younger than her, not of mixed black African heritage. Um, so she couldn't quite understand. I mean, admittedly, there were some performance and lateness issues with, with her conduct, but that wasn't particularly uncommon with, with under, other individuals who, who had been promoted. So the final straw came when she saw another individual promoted ahead of her, so she raised a grievance. And this individual was younger than her, not black, and also um, she was on a final written warning. So that grievance was dismissed and was given pretty short shrift by Aspers. So she raised a second grievance, and this grievance um, related to a number of things, but, but specifically that she'd been discriminated against, victimised and harassed because of the first grievance that she brought, and this was by her colleagues. This was also dismissed. <laughs> so on appeal, the appeal manager said to her that if she continued to use the word discrimination, well, it's likely that disciplinary proceedings would, would happen against her, which obviously is entirely inappropriate. So as a result of this conduct, she went off work sick. And after a period of time, she was fit enough to return and attended a return to work interview. And during this interview, what Aspers said to her was that you could come back and work in your old job, but obviously work with the individuals that were, were discriminating against her. Or she could work on a gaming table, so long as she undertook a six week training course. This was highly irregular given her length of experience but also the fact that new recruits didn't have to undertake that length of, of training. So the, EA, so the tribunal decided that that was purely because she'd raised these complaints. So given all that treatment, given all the conduct of, of the respondent, uh, she resigned. So she was successful with some elements of her claim. So she, she was successful with a constructive unfair dismissal claim and also a victimization claim as well. And she was awarded 75,000 pounds in compensation which obviously is a substantial sum of money. I think that was probably due to the conduct of the respondent. But there's some really interesting takeaways from this case. So, so firstly, um, an element of her successful victimization claim was because she wasn't invited to out of work social drinks. And on the face of it, that seemed really odd to me. So we have a quick look at the legal definition of victimization. So victimization occurs where A subjects B to a detriment, and we'll come back to detriment in a minute, because B does a protected act, or A believes that B has done or may do the same protected act. And protected acts can include making allegations. So obviously here she made allegations of discrimination, so that box is ticked. So turning to the detriment now. So in this case, it was really clear that she'd made a complaint against her colleagues. Everybody knew what the complaint was and they knew that she'd made it. So in Christmas 2018, her cashier colleagues were organising drinks. They were vocally talking about going out after work. And she was purposely excluded from those drinks. And although this wasn't a kind of Asper's organised thing, it was the type of thing that she absolutely should have been invited to, given her role. And she, she wasn't purely because of her discrimination complaints. So the tribunal decided that this exclusion was to her detriment, the key bit there, because she'd lost the opportunity to bond with her colleagues and ultimately that would prevent her from progressing. And it was difficult for Aspers to, Aspers to argue against that given the fact that she'd been overlooked for promotion on a number of occasions. So you're clearly there, so protected act ticked, and obviously detriment had been ticked as well, so the claim was made out. So I suppose the takeaway from that is it just shows the importance of undertaking proper equality and diversity training with employees, because that may have stopped a lot of these complaints, um, but also it would have provided a much better defence for Aspers. And I know at Kites we're doing quite a lot of equality and diversity training at the moment. So the next takeaway is, is a bit briefer, was just the fact that a lot of the claimants' discrimination claim was significantly out of time. So it was some 14 months out of time. As we probably know that to bring a discrimination claim, usually it's gotta be within three months of the act complained of. But here the tribunal said, and it's, you see this quite often, that in the absence of substantial prejudice to the respondent, to say, for example, a key witness had left over that 14 month period. In the absence of that, well, tribunals are often minded to exercise their discretion to extend time. So even if you get past three months, doesn't necessarily mean you're out the woods. And finally, and, and, and really briefly, um, what I noted in this case is that the claimant had clearly covert recorded lots of meetings. 
And the tribunal had no issue in using those, those recordings and those transcripts. And they really didn't help Aspers, they really supported her case. So it's just a final reminder to say that if you're going to stop employees from covert recording, make sure your policies are, and contracts are properly up to date. So that's treated as misconduct, because I'm sure, I'm sure Aspers would much rather have done that than, than left dealing with, with what was something that was quite embarrassing for them. So that's it for the case law update. I'm going to hand you over to, to Kevin. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, and good morning, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I'm uh, Kevin McKenna and I head up the uh, employment uh, law team, uh, but I'm uh, also uh, the HR partner for uh, Kites. And so when considering uh, this uh, talk uh, today about the battle for talent retention and recruitment post COVID, um, uh, I approached it, I think, with both of those uh, hats on. Um, so, uh, yeah, as a day-to-day -day job, uh, you know, I deal a lot with um, with business owners and uh, and directors and HR directors and and managers and so on. Um, but also, I, I mean, very often I'm I'm doing and there's things that you do and dealing with the same kinds of issues. And uh, and one of the major issues, I suppose, that we're all seeing in the press and radio television at the moment is about the battle for talent and the huge issues that there are there. Um, at least you might want to move on to the next uh, slide. So um, there's um, a historic shift in, in the workforce um, and changes uh, that have meant that huge numbers of people um, have quit their jobs in the, last, uh, in the last couple of years. And we're now in a position where um, we've got record-breaking vacancies, 1.3 million vacancies at the end of 2021, uh, and there aren't that many people who are uh, unemployed. So it's a really difficult position. It's one uh, that I think when you um, talk to businesses, occasionally you can uh, feel as if it might be something that's focused on you or your business, but it's something that's uh, happening uh, across all, all sectors uh, and across the entire country. Uh, and indeed worldwide. So it's a, a significant problem. And there are uh, no doubt many causes for it, economic causes, um, uh, rising cost of living, wage stagnation, uh, but also uh, big changes because of the uh, psychological and sociological um, issues that have arisen over the, uh, over the COVID, over the periods of lockdown where people's lives have changed um, immeasurably uh, and where they've, uh, in some instances had uh, parts of their life uh, back that they're not willing to now give up, say the opportunity maybe to just to um, have dinner with your family or uh, see your children, pick them up from school, uh, see, uh, see them play sports, all those sorts of things and, and changes for people at all different ages and, uh, and levels. And maybe the next slide, uh, thank you. Um, so employers are struggling then with uh, recruitment. There's that increase in the competition for uh, talent, getting uh, people with the right skills. There are now different um, expectations in relation to work-life uh, balance, uh, and there are different expectations in relation to salaries. Uh, and there is this huge move away from uh, on-site working. So... Um, According to research, nearly 70% of people want uh, to work flexibly and 43% uh, of that figure want hybrid working and 25% want um, fully remote working. And so there's a huge shift um, towards that. And according to um, Monster Jobs uh, research, nearly half of all employers say that offering flexible working options give them an advantage uh, when recruiting. But this isn't all about... Um, flexible working, uh, because this is a bigger uh, issue than that, although we'll go into that. And um, th there's probably enough really there about describing the problem. Um, uh, that maybe not that helpful for you, uh, for me to just uh, spend this time telling you about the problem when you when you know that, appreciate that, and you're living through it. So if you maybe go on to the next slide, um, Lucy. Um, so in terms of uh, how you overcome that, then I think that there are lots of um, factors to take into consideration. Um, and part of that is understanding what um, motivates candidates and how that uh, has changed over time. And clearly, competitive salary has always been a major factor 
uh, in uh, in the issue of recruitment, and that and that remains um, the case. Um, there are um, much there's much discussion about whether you should uh, advertise um, salaries, and I think that the growing evidence is that with the changing market, that you clearly should uh, you shouldn't say competitive salary. You should uh, say what the salaries are, or at least give uh, bandings. Um, there's more information out there that allows people to find out that kind of information. It's what people want to know. It is rare, but not um, uh, unseen that people move jobs for the same or a lower salary. Uh, that does happen. Lots of people leave jobs, for instance, because uh, because they don't like their bosses um, uh, and for many other reasons. Um, uh, but salary is the kind of information that people can find out more about anyway and will look for. But it also says something about your business and about transparency. And so you should uh, think carefully about, um, about how you advertise in that respect. And flexibility, as I've said, is important and remote working and diversity um, is important um, in relation to uh, trying to uh, um, uh, appeal to the widest possible market in relation to uh, your vacancies. But there are um, other factors that I think are, are becoming of growing importance that I think businesses uh, should look at if they're not already. And you need to look at what is uh, what's different about your business or the things that maybe you don't um, leverage enough, uh, but which uh, growing numbers of, uh, of candidates are looking for. And so what sorts of things uh, are they? Well, um, they're what your position is as a business in relation to things like corporate social responsibility. What's your position on that? Do you support uh, charities? Do you support local charities? Is that visible? Would anybody be able to tell that from, um, from any of the information that's out there about your business? What's your position on uh, environmental sustainability? Do you have one? Again, is that visible? Would people be able to see that? Uh, what's the position on equality, diversion and inclusion? James mentioned about training, but again, uh, how does that manifest itself? Um, very often, you know, what you put out there in relation to your business, whether it be on LinkedIn or other uh, social media, will tell people about, about those things. Do you recognise or, or celebrate um, religious festivals? Um, uh, uh, what's your position on... Uh, you know, do you celebrate Black History Month, uh, Gay Pride, all of these sorts of things? What does your business say, if anything, about those sorts of things? Uh, the increasing prominence of, uh, of the um, mental health crisis that's, uh, that's I suppose, grown um, throughout the country. What's your business's position on that? Do you have mental health uh, first aiders? Do you have employee assistance programmes? Um, businesses with more than five employees are obliged to carry out um, uh, stress risk assessments. Have you done that? In my experience, very few businesses have. If you have, then there's more likely to be other things that would flow from that that would tell uh, your existing employees and future employees about what you do and how you address those sorts of issues. What are your uh, family friendly provisions and policies? Uh, do you give enhanced maternity pay, paternity pay, parental leave, bereavement leave? Uh, these are things that you might be able to uh, leverage, things that you're already doing or could do, uh, which will um, attract uh, uh, new, uh, new talent. Menopause policies. Um, are, are you looking at those sorts of issues, addressing that, um, uh, those the, 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 the growing prominence and recognition of the uh, of the issues that affect uh, large parts of your workforce. What has your stance been on thing on the political issues of the day about the Ukraine conflict, Black Lives Matter, and so on? Um, and uh, people will are increasingly looking at uh, what did you do during COVID? Um, did you uh, make redundancies? Uh, were you quick to cut people? Um, did you reduce people's pay? If you did, did you pay people back? Did you claim furlough? Did you pay the furlough back? Did you claim furlough? Were there irregularities in it? Um, and are you one of those employers that's being investigated in relation to that? And what sorts of things does your business do in relation to its sports and social activities? So those are all sort of arguably internal uh, issues to your business 
which could be part, I suppose, of your shop window, things that you're already doing, not no extra cost uh, for those things. So be mindful of that. But then there are things which are, I suppose, uh, which are the external things that you may have greater or lesser um, control over. Um, some things will be around your financial st uh, stability, your, uh, your accounts, your profitability, how healthy is your business. If you've got a healthy, sustainable business, then that's maybe one of the things that, again, you should leverage. Is your business going to be there in two years' time will be a factor for um, potential um, candidates. Uh, it's the sort of thing that we seem to be seeing more and more people want to know about what the what the plans are what's the five-year plan what's the um what are the plans for the business what's your employee stability index you can calculate that to see whether or not your business uh, is a revolving door and if that's something that's positive for your business then you should make the most of it uh, many businesses should be publishing their anti-slavery position if you're supposed to do that are you doing it is it saying everything um, that it should be saying. Of course, you've got um, uh, the rise of Glassdoor, another review um, uh, website. What's your position there? Um, how healthy does that look? What's your tribunal record look like? All tribunal decisions are now published on, a, um, on the government portal. People can look up and read detailed judgments about the good, the bad and the ugly that goes on in your business. And there are now more instances of the government using government departments using naming and shaming uh, as a means of uh, regulating issues such as national minimum wage and whether you've paid the tribunal awards that you should. So watch your record on that. There's more information out there and there's more information that employees uh, can get hold of. So make sure that you are careful about how you use um, that to your advantage. Um, so next slide, please. So there's then an issue about, I suppose, about re retainment and how you um, keep people. And that, that's also a difficulty. And, uh, and again, we're seeing lots of clients and we see it in our own sector of people that are uh, leaving for uh, what are significant pay increases. Um, and do you follow that? Can you keep up with that? What should employers do? Well, um, I've talked about um, embracing um, hybrid working because that's just as important for the people that currently work with you. Not every business can do that. Not every business can give the flexibility. Um, so, uh, so it's important, I suppose, to recognise that. It's important to recognise that there is no legal obligation. It was something that was anticipated in the, uh, in the Queen's speech as a potential day one right, the right to request flexible working. But that isn't, the, uh, that, that, uh, isn't going to be coming into legislation uh, in the next session. And so there is no uh, entitlement to flexible working. It remains the case. There's simply an entitlement to request flexible working, but that's subject to having completed uh, a 26, week, um, uh, 26 weeks of service. If you are bringing that in or have brought it in, then I think it's important that you have in place policies around that, some clarity. Uh, that's what people then need is how it works, how it's going to work within, uh, within your business and what are the parameters of that? Uh, because there is a danger then that it just becomes, a, it can become a bit of a wild west for employees to sometimes just do what they want when they want. And for some businesses that will, uh, that will absolutely work, but for others it won't and that's something to uh, manage. Um, you should um, prioritise performance management, perhaps, and look at outputs rather than presenteeism. Uh, address underperformance because not dealing with performance issues is one of those things that can affect morale within teams. So managing actively is something which will help you uh, with your retention. Uh, invest in employees. Um, the, I suppose one of the ways of, uh, of overcoming the battle for talent is making talent. So it's cheaper to train people uh, than to, uh, than to uh, recruit them. And it's one of the mantras, I suppose, that I've, I've worked by, uh, which I think is borrowing a phrase that I heard from, I think from uh, football scouts, which was about scouting the, scout the attitude, not talent, that you can train uh, skills, but not uh, attitude. So. I think that there are some lessons to be learned there. Don't rely on constant salary increases because that's not sustainable. Um, there is um, a, 
Uh, at the moment, uh, the largest ever four day week pilot that's um, taking place largely uh, in this country. There are, um, it's a pilot uh, under which uh, 3,300 workers based throughout the UK uh, in 30 sectors um, are receiving 100% uh, of their pay for 80% of their time, uh, but in exchange for a commitment to maintain at least a 100% productivity. I'm sure it would be attractive to lots of people. It's already happening. We're seeing that more and more of businesses moving to sometimes to four and a half days or four day weeks to do that. It's the biggest uh, of, its, uh, of its kind that's going on at the moment. It's been observed by, I mean, there are other countries that are taking part in it, but Britain is the spearheading uh, that. It's regarded as what's called a triple dividend um, policy of helping employees, companies, and the climate. So it's something to look at perhaps. Um, I do wonder though whether it's how easy it is to row back just like um, hybrid working and remote working. Once you've gone there, how easy is it to get back if it doesn't work? Maybe look at restrictive covenants, can be a bit heavy handed to keep people, but it can sometimes tip the balance if somebody doesn't really want to leave, but they've been approached by headhunters as to how easy it is to leave if you've done everything that you can to protect your business. So look at them, look at restrictions, make sure that they're reasonable, make sure that they're enforceable. And another big thing for us has been handle levers correctly. The way that you approach people that leave you can be important for uh, for the future, your employees will watch how you handle levers. And uh, there are lots of businesses that are developing um, policies around that to encourage what they call boomerang employees. So people who might be more likely to return and come back and who you know as known quantities. It's something that I've done a paper on for um, Kites. If anyone's interested in uh, hearing more about that or maybe me sharing that with you, then give me a shout. You, Lucy said you'll get the details about that. Um, I, I mentioned about um, salary, um, and, and that's something that um, uh, Kirsty will be talking about, and different ways of paying things, uh, paying people. Um, it, it, just to looking uh, briefly at, um, I suppose, one instance, one example, early example of how uh, businesses are adapting to um, uh, the situation post COVID. Some of you will have heard, many of you will have heard about Stevenson Harwood, the law firm who said that employees could work from home full time, but only if they took a 20% um, pay cut. Um, there will be, I suppose, more and more instances of that sort of thing where they're trying to really encourage, uh, in some instances, employees to come uh, back to the office or to take advantage of the potential cost savings that, are, uh, that come from that. There is some care, I think, to be taken in relation to how policies uh, will affect your workers. Um, policies like that uh, often translated in, in employment law into what you call a PCP, a provision criterion and practice. Do those have a disproportionate um, detrimental impact upon uh, one uh, group of people with protected characteristics th than another? And there's been some discussion about whether that uh, might be the case with, um, with policies um, such as this. They take some care uh, around um, introducing policies of that sort of nature. Um, if I can then move on to the uh, uh, la last slide uh, for me, I think I'm running broadly on, on time. Uh, it's just looking at the, uh, the position uh, in relation to uh, sickness absence and long COVID, which I suppose is one of those issues that we weren't battling uh, with a couple of years ago. Uh, and there has been, um, uh, suggestions from the uh, Equality and Human Rights Commission that businesses should uh, carefully consider uh, treating uh, their those employees or even uh, candidates who are affected by long COVID uh, as though uh, they have a disability. Uh, there's still more to learn uh, about the uh, condition of long COVID and, and no doubt it will affect people in different ways. Um, Long COVID uh, is an informal term, it's uh, to describe cases uh, that last longer than 12 weeks uh, and cannot be explained by any other condition. Uh, nothing about this changes the definition of, uh, of a disability uh, under the Equality Act, which is that you must have, in order to qualify for, um, uh, for protection, you would have a physical or mental impairment that has a, 
uh, long-term and substantial impact upon your ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. And uh, of course, some of these instances might not be uh, long-term, um, but again, you should uh, take some care. It's not a deemed condition, so it will, will be treated in the usual way. Um, and, uh, but taking a cautious approach, you should consider reasonable adjustments, consider occupational health referrals, make sure that you really understand the condition, uh, which is not something to be done without um, expert medical uh, advice. Uh, and as I said on the last two bullet points, keep in contact with employees and assist them with uh, their return to work. Uh, that uh, is the end of uh, my section. As I mentioned, uh, Kirsty's going to talk to us a little bit more about some incentivization strategies. So I'll hand over to her. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, all. I'm Kirsty Pennell and pleased to meet you. As mentioned, I head up the corporate team at Kites. And as such, our focus for incentivization of employees is usually on equity, issuing shares to employees or granting them options, i.e., the right to buy shares in the employer company. However, before I go into that in too much detail, I do have to say that you should never lose sight of a clearly defined cash bonus scheme. After all, cash is king. So what are the key points to consider when thinking about incentivizing employees? I find that the various aspects from a commercial, legal and tax point of view um, should be considered in the round and a meeting with the key decision makers at an employer company together with its tax advisors is invaluable to kick things off. It's a team effort. Some of the key points which I think should be considered are the commercial rationale. In the current competitive employment market, as Kevin was outlining, it's important to consider how to attract and retain employees. A well thought out incentivization package or scheme can be used to ensure employees are motivated with the incentivization, which is in their personal interests, also being aligned with the business's interests as an equity interest creates a sense of ownership with the associated responsibility. In terms of that ownership, what key points to consider, what percentage interest should an employee have? It really depends on their role and contribution to the business. More senior management have, can have a quite a high percentage, more junior employees, relatively minute percentages. Whilst it's clearly in the business's interest for the associated feeling of ownership to encourage employees to take more responsibility and put the business first, some company owners can have concerns that it might give employees ideas above their station or that they get too big for their boots. So it's worth considering what rights an equity stake would give an employee, bearing in mind that a few percent doesn't actually give the employee any real rights at law. And finally, there's always the question of what happens if the employee with an equity stake then leaves the business. In terms of what is issued or created when, when should an employee benefit from an equity stake? Have they already proved themselves or should some performance conditions be set before any equity ownership vests? Performance conditions can be useful to ensure that the alignment of a business's interests with an individual is in a way measured with as smart performance conditions um, as possible kept simple. For example, if an employee is joining you and they say they can create, generate significant revenues through their contacts, they should be able to put their money where their mouth is with performance conditions tying in with specific revenue targets to be met over specific time periods. And last but not least, whilst the tax tail should never wag the dog, separate tax advice is always needed when considering incentivizing employees. Essentially, and without giving the actual tax advice, if shares are issued to an employee at less than market value, the difference can be taxable as if it were a benefit in kind. So, what are the main options, alternatives available to incentivize employees? So I've referred to, it's always worth considering a cash bonus scheme. But as a corporate lawyer, firstly, there's shares. There's a few times we are asked to help give employees shares in a company. And there's always the debt potential downside that no employee likes an unexpected tax bill. Can the employee actually afford to pay the market value for the shares or not? Owning shares gives that warm ownership feeling and the employee can then be rewarded through payment of dividends, which directly ties in with a company's profitability. The shares themselves can be structured so that dividends can be declared at different rates on an employee's shares 
with, diff with the dividends aligned to that individual's performance. As I referred to above, a key question is what happens when an employee with shares then leaves? The answer is that the shares are then usually offered to the company or to the shareholders to buy. And the price paid ties in with whether the employee is a so-called good lever or bad lever. If you're a bad lever, you get paid what you paid for the shares. If you're a good lever, you get the then market value for the shares, which hopefully will have increased. So the question is, what would a good lever be? Rather facetiously, I sometimes say, to keep it simple, it's if the employee is carried out in the coffin or on a stretcher, or if the shareholders decide they're a good lever. Um, it's much easier than going into the detail of whether a good lever should be an employee who's been unfairly or wrongfully dismissed. Well, I'm sure Kevin and his team will have something to say about that. An alternative to shares is to actually grant an option, i.e. give the employee the right to buy the shares in the future. Performance conditions can be set, which need to be met by the employee before he or she can exercise the option and buy the shares, tying in with the potential alignment of interests I've already referred to. The main plus of an option for the employee is that they don't need to find the money to pay for the shares until they actually exercise the option, and that might only be on an exit. Indeed, the majority of options that we deal with are only exercisable on an exit, and so there's no question of the employee owning the shares until there's a right realisation for value. And finally, something called growth or flowering shares, and we've got some other fancy names, a bit of a hybrid solution, but it involves the creation of a new class of share which is issued direct to the employee with a right to return on an exit, which only ties in with future increases in value of the business. So the employee doesn't have to pay much now for the shares because they're not worth much now. So it's definitely should ensure the employee is keen on increasing the value of the business going forward because that's the only way they'll see a return. And obviously there's usually some form of good lever, bad lever provisions. So in terms of options, there are various types of options which can be granted. I'm throwing some jargon out there. The main tax advantaged options, all of which are subject to statutory requirements, which must be met in order to maintain the associated tax advantages. So care is needed to make sure that those are understood upfront. The CSOPs, Company Share Option Plan, um, which gives a relatively low value to an individual employee. SAYE, save as you earn, pretty much as it says on the tin but mainly used by listed companies. EMI, Enterprise Management Incentives, which are the most common form that we use for owner-managed businesses in practice. And so I'll refer to those a bit more, a bit of detail shortly. And SIPs, Share Incentive Plans, which involve an EBT, the Employee Benefit Trust. So a bit more complex, a bit more expensive really to set up. Otherwise, the non tax advantage, generally refer to them as unapproved options, which are usually used for consultants or if a tax advantage, options can't be granted. And LTIPs, long-term incentive plans, which again, mainly used by listed companies. And occasionally you'll hear about phantom share option plans, which is really a fancy word for cash bonus linked to the value of shares. So moving on, EMI options. They're the most common form of options that are granted by an owner-managed business in my experience, and that's what we usually deal with. Key points for EMIs, without going into too much detail, they are tax advantageous for the employee, more so than many, many options, and so they are, that's why the reasons they're preferred, and even for the company have some tax benefits too. Another thing is that the HM HMRC will agree the value up front, which means you can set up the exercise price knowing any potential tax consequences as well up front. There are various qualifications and criteria that need to be met. In terms of the company, essentially it's got to be an entrepreneurial, so it can't be too large and not all businesses qualify. Um, in terms of businesses that don't qualify, they're usually property-based companies or professional services, which unfortunately includes solicitors, so can't grant those to our employees. Um, in terms of the employee, they've got to be an employee and there's a continued working time commitment of at least 25 hours a week, or if less, 75% of working time. There are also specific limits in terms of the value of options which can be granted and over, um, but to an individual employee and overall by the company. For the documentation, the terms themselves, you can have an overarching main plan and grant individual agreements 
an option pursuant to that, which is better for um, companies who are intending to grant EMI options to a large number of employees, or just do simple, straightforward individual option agreements. And if you'll have to cover when they vest and are exercisable, what happens if an employee leaves, and otherwise reflect the legislation. In terms of the actual process, we normally liaise with a company's accountants to agree evaluation with HMRC up front to tie with the exercise price, and then actually enter into the documentation. And the grant of the option itself needs to be formally notified to HMRC. And there are ongoing notification requirements which have to be dealt with on an annual basis. So that was hopefully a good flavour of the ways in which employees can be incentivised through equity. Now it's time to hand over to my colleague, Bruce. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Um, uh, apologies for the alarming appearance or the manner of it. Um, I'm Bruce Jones. I head the intellectual property team at Kites, and I shall give you a short canter through reputation management. And I've been particularly asked to address the kinds of things that may appear on this marvelous website, Glassdoor, um, which of course is a place that I imagine you're all quite concerned about what people say about you. Um, and so I shall try and provide a brief exposition of, of the position in relation to this and maybe what would be a good or not a good thing to do. Um, the high watermark of what I'm gonna say is that Glassdoor is a website and a website is a publisher and that in the ordinary course of things, publishers are liable for statements that they may make, which are defamatory in the same way as anybody else. Um, that's kind of as good as it gets, because there are a number of buts to that statement. And but number one is that honest opinion is a defamation defense. So if someone were to post on Glassdoor, I hate working here, it makes me feel depressed because I look out the window and the view is bleak. Um, that's an honest opinion. It's identified the basis of the opinion, which is that you look out the window and it's bleak and it's honestly held. So there is nothing you can do about that. Um, but that's not the worst of it. The, the second but is that Glassdoor is not someone who is posting its own content and it's able to put forward a defense that it is not the person who posted the content on its own website. Now, obviously that's kind of what it's there for, to put other people's statements up there. And that's a, a, a bad situation for you. There is um, a carve out, shall we say. So there's an exception to this defense that it has. Um, if it's able to be shown by you that you can't identify someone who has posted a statement on that website, that you've given Glassdoor uh, a notice of complaint in connection with the statement, and that Glassdoor has failed to respond in accordance with the regulations. Um, for the eagle eyed amongst you, that third element is probably the catch. Failed to respond in accordance with the regulations. What are the regulations? They are the snappily named Defamation Operators of Websites Regulations 2013. Um, and they set out effectively a very long, complicated, and pretty much toothless protocol for you to complain to Glassdoor. Um, the chances of you succeeding in getting something taken down are well foreshadowed when you read Glassdoor terms and conditions. Um, they're very US centric you can see that they're really based around what they would consider to be First Amendment rights, which is all about free speech. And there's a very clear and explicit indication of the fact that there will be no naming of posters if they can possibly avoid it, which of course makes perfect sense because that's kind of where they make their money. People posting interesting things about people or employers on the website. If everything was rather anodyne, there would be really no no action around this website and Glassdoor wouldn't be making any money. So really the, the, the way to summarize what you might be able to get taken down most easily is stuff like trade secrets, confidential information and so on. But if it's, if it's just unhelpful opinions about you as an employer, that's more difficult. 
what happens if you have tried, you haven't managed to get them to take a post down, and you can't identify someone, you're not getting any traction, are you completely without remedy? Well, the answer is not necessarily. There is uh, a remedy called the Norwich Pharmacal Order, um, which is uh, from a case of about 30, 40 years ago. And this basically provides you with a vehicle to obtain information about someone who might have posted something on Glassdoor. The conditions for the granting of that order are effectively a fall in test, which is that where Glassdoor, uh, as the poster of uh, the, the poster of um, an opinion, is in this instance an instant party, as you will have seen, because they're not liable. They have information, which is the identity of the person who's posted the statement, in connection with some wrongdoing, which in this instance is the statement that you would consider to be defamatory, and it's against you as an employer, then you may get the court to compel Glassdoor to reveal the poster's identity. Uh, there has been one relatively recent instance of an employer trying to get this done um, back at the end of April, uh, and that was uh, a company called BW Legal Services Limited, and they sought in the first instance to get a Norwich Pharmacal order. They did so without telling Glassdoor, and in the first instance, they were granted one. Glassdoor appealed, and the Court of Appeal threw the order out. They threw the order out um, primarily on the fact that Glassdoor is a company registered in California, and that's where they should have been served. Now, that may seem like an insurmountable hurdle to you, um, because who wants to go around serving in California? But when you get into the meat of the decision, there was an indication that if other things had happened in the right way, that may have been able to have been worked around. The more serious uh, problem is that the Court of Appeal observed that they were unlikely to have granted the order, even if all the other formalities had been met, because they couldn't see there was the likelihood of serious harm. Um, what is the meaning of serious harm? Well, serious harm is the test for defamation or actionable defamation. And in the context of someone who trades for profit, serious harm means serious financial loss. So you will have to establish a nexus between what is being said about that you, that you are finding troublesome on the one hand, and the ability to demonstrate either actual serious financial loss or a likelihood of it arising from that. And as you can imagine, that is an extremely difficult hurdle to get over. Um, and so, what kind of sums of money are we talking here in relation to the kinds of cases that you might bring? Well, let's look at Sir Cliff. Um, let's remember what happened to him. He was raided by the police because he was suspected of being a paedophile. Hard to think of the worst thing that someone might say about you. The police tipped off the BBC, who then broadcast the whole episode. Um, and so effectively, the BBC were broadcasting that Cliff might be a paedophile. You'll see this headline here, BBC pays two million in final settlement after privacy case. Well, you think, well, OK, so he won and he got two million. Well, no, he didn't. Um, what he actually got in damages was £210,000. Someone calls him a paedophile and he gets and broadcasts it on the single biggest national media of the country and he gets £210,000. Now, I know it's not a small sum of money to the likes of me and me, but that's, that's contextualizing the kinds of sums that are awarded. And that's one of the biggest awards ever in this country. So where did the two million come from? Well, most of that was an award of costs. So you may say, well, okay, Cliff got his money back then. Uh, no, Cliff spent more than three million clearing his name. So he ended up a million down. The BBC ended up two million down. There really were no winners um, in that whole episode. And what this really goes to show is you have to think very, very carefully before you're going to start going legal in relation to questions of defamation. There are winners in relation to defamation. But if we consider, for example, a more recent case, um, we can identify the winner in that case. And 
it's not Rebecca Budd, because even if she were to win on a technicality, and she may yet, I think the venting of her dirty laundry in public has not been good for her. The winner can be seen climbing out of the back of a car behind her, carrying what looks suspiciously to me like a Birkin bag. That's Charlotte Harris, which is Rebecca Bardi's lawyer. Now, I could also put a picture of the permatand Anthony Sherborne on the other side here, but I think you get the point. Um, so what can you do in relation to this stuff? Well, I think really the best answer is prevention better than cure. So I point you back to the kinds of observations that Kevin made in relation to retention and people leaving, because ultimately, um, I don't think the people who are going to be taking the defam defamation action are going to be the winners. It's, it's going to be the lawyers. Um, so thank you for your time. And um, that's all from me. Um, thank you, Bruce, for that. Um, and so just signing off now. Um, so thank you to all of our speakers, um, James, Kevin, Kirsty, and Bruce. Um, like I said at the start, we will send a follow-up email to you all um, with the recording, the slides, um, and the contact details that you see here on the screen now. We will send those over to you um, in an email. Um, next HR Breakfast Club um, is going to be in September. Um, yeah, September 2022. So um, we hope to see you all there um, again. Um, so yeah, in the meantime, thank you all for attending um, this morning and please do get in touch with us um, if you have any questions. Thanks everyone, bye.